Today we're concluding our sermon series through the parables of Jesus. I haven't taught on all of these parables, but I've, I've uh, tried to teach on at least one or two in each subject. There's probably about 15 different subjects that Jesus talks about in his parables, and so I've tried to touch on each of these as we've taught through his parables so far this year over the roughly, I guess, 13 weeks or so uh, that we've done this. But the the last one we're dealing with today is in Luke chapter 16. So if you have a copy of the scriptures, go ahead and turn there. But in, in many ways, I've saved the best for last. Uh, this, uh, this parable is on the subject of money, which, you know, everybody likes to talk about that. Uh, everybody likes to hear what preachers have to say about money. Um, Amen. Yeah, thank you. And... Uh, uh, but it's a very important subject in Jesus' teaching, and so I'd be remiss if I didn't address it and, uh, and try to do my best with how Jesus teaches on it. Uh, the parable that we're going to look at is known in a couple different ways. It's, it's known as the dishonest manager, which is what I'll call it today, but it's also known as the unjust steward or the shrewd manager. These are all fun, fun ideas, but these are popular titles. And the parable, if, if, for those of you... Uh, who've read it, you know this. The parable is very difficult to interpret, and here in a minute you'll see why. There's some kind of confusing things in it. Um, I don't think it's as difficult to apply as it is to interpret, but the difficulty in the application comes because, just like with anything Jesus teaches, uh, often we know what to do, but then actually doing it <laughs> is, is a world apart. We know what to do. But to actually step out and to begin to live our lives that way and to begin to treat people that way or to, to uh, um, live that way is, is a different thing altogether. Knowing and doing are, are two different things. And, uh, and this is what Jesus tries to bring together, I think, here in this parable. And so let's uh, take a moment to read the parable of the dishonest manager here in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. He also said to the disciples... There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him, and he said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I'm removed from my management, people may receive me into their houses. So he summoned his master's debtors one by one. He said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. The manager commended the dishonest manager for his, excuse me, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So this parable is not without its difficulties, as you can tell. Uh, We look at the actions of this dishonest manager, and it's obvious that he's wrong. He undercuts his boss's profits because he's about to lose his job, and he wants to make sure that all of these clients would be ingratiated toward him when he was unemployed. And then and we look at that and we're like, man, that's a brilliant strategy. It's wrong, <laughs> but it's brilliant. You know, what, a, what a way to, to make sure you provide for yourself, right? At the end of the day, effectively, he's stealing from his boss. And in the real world, we all know this guy would have been prosecuted. Uh, there would have been, uh, been repercussions for his actions. But in this story, which is a parable that Jesus tells, and as with parables, not everything has to correspond exactly with reality or be the way it ought to be, because Jesus tells these things with a specific intent. And so rather than prosecuting the manager, uh, the boss here commends him for his savvy, for his shrewdness, but not his dishonesty, not his actions. It's not an elevation of dishonest character. It's the way that he did these things he's commended for. His dishonesty isn't commended, but his street smarts are. 
He's, he's, uh, he has some business savvy about him, and that's what the Master acknowledges. And then Jesus takes this little story, and in verses 8 through 13, he begins to apply how this little parable talks about money. I believe the story is important for several reasons when we get to Jesus' teaching, but one of the things he does is he sets up a two-world framework here. There's the way things work in this world, and the way things work in the world to come. And the story talks about how uh, Jesus differentiates between these two things. In verse 8, he refers to the sons of light, excuse me, the sons of this world and their generation, and then they're contrasted with the sons of light. There's two worlds here. There's two motivations. There's two goals to what's going on here. Now, some of the actions make a difference that's limited to this world, and some have lasting differences. There are some benefits to actions that are temporary, and there are some benefits that are eternal. And Jesus says the sons of this world live only for this world, but the sons of light live in two worlds. The sons of light aren't prohibited from being shrewd or savvy in their dealings in this world, like the dishonest manager. We're not prevented from using our savvy, using our shrewdness, but we're to have an eye for a coming kingdom and how that has present implications. And so, uh, in, in a lot of ways, believers have a foot in two worlds. And it makes it very confusing. It makes it very difficult to know uh, uh, how to live sometimes, to know what to put emphasis on, to know how much emphasis to put on various things, because we deal with present and future motivations in our actions. Uh, many people in our world, and, and in fact, most people, live for the here and now. They, they can't see past the end of their nose, you might say. Uh, they only live for today's struggles, and they try to make sense of this. But those who follow Christ are different because we know there's something coming. We know God's kingdom is coming, that Christ will one day set things right and will live a different way. And so we have a foot in this world and a foot in that world, a foot in this kingdom and the foot in the kingdom to come. We have responsibilities here. There's work to be done. There's, there's provision to be made. Things need to happen here. That's undeniable. But our hope isn't here. Our hope lies in what's to come. We're to enjoy the life God has given us here. But our eyes continually look to the day when Christ returns in His kingdom in all of His fullness. And so, with these two worlds in mind, dealing with what needs to be dealt with here, but also looking forward to what is to come, Jesus takes this, this now and this not yet, and He applies it to how we look at our money, to how we look at our possessions, how we look at our wealth. And so, to try to piece this together in the best way I can, I'm going to give you three principles here, you know, like, like the good old Baptist preachers do, right? Three principles for uh, that we can learn on eternity and money. The first principle is what I'll call the leverage principle. In this story, Jesus tells in verse 4, uh, the manager leverages his influence over the financial well-being of his boss's debtors so that when he's fired, he'll have a place to stay. It's kind of comical. Uh, yeah, I'm glad it wasn't me, you know. Uh, we're, we're all kind of uh, in that position, I think. We see how he was shrewd, he was wise, but we're glad it didn't happen to us. And then in verse 8, Jesus says that the people of this world know how to leverage their money. They know how to use their money to make provisions for their future here. I mean, this is something that many of us are engaged in. You know, we, we work today and we save a little bit so that one day down the road we'll have some left. The idea of retirement comes in here, you know, and whether or not that's a, a biblical idea, we're not going to get into, but there's a, um, there's a certain amount of wisdom toward preparing for what's yet to come and what's unknown. And the people of this world know how to do this in many ways. Many people, some people don't, but many people do. And so Jesus says, if people in this world know how to make preparations for the here and now, then it only makes sense that those who have a foot in both kingdoms would make preparations for both worlds. Make preparations for what's here, like anybody else does, but with an eye toward what's to come. Uh, Jesus then calls us to be shrewd, to be savvy, to use our networking, to use all that we have, not only for this world and the future we have in this world, but what is to come, the kingdom he's bringing. So we are to use our money, which so easily corrupts us, so that when all is said and done, it will have made an eternal difference in our lives and the lives of others. 
In verse 9, Jesus uses this part of the story to make a point that matters for eternity. We're to leverage our finances to make an eternal impact. He says, make friends with unrighteous wealth. What makes wealth unrighteous? The best, the best sense I can make of that is to talk about the corrupting nature of wealth. Money influences like nothing else can. We all know this. Money talks, they say. You know, what it's the, uh, What's the old phrase? Mo money, mo problems. We, we, we know about this. Money makes the world go round, we say. And it's natural to focus uh, on the things of this world because we're in this world. It's natural to let money uh, work in this world because it does work in this world. But we can never forget that we weren't made for only this world. That this world isn't all there is. There's something more. There's something coming. There's something bigger. So we have to always keep this perspective in our minds. Money does have value. That's not denied. There's value to it. But it's only in this world that it has value. There's a time coming when money will no longer have value. And for those of us who follow Christ, this is a certain perspective we bring to the table. Uh, to our work, the way we earn our money, to the way we spend our money, and to how we, how we approach money altogether. It has an unrighteous quality to it. It, it has a corrupting quality because it constantly draws our attention to the here and now, rather than the what's to come. It, it, focuses us, it focuses us here. In this world, we need it, and we use it. But it's crucial that we don't forget it's only valuable here. It's not valuable there. Uh, Jesus says the way we make sure it doesn't corrupt us is to use it for eternal purposes. He says, make friends so they'll receive you in eternal dwellings. There's an eternal quality to the way we use money. Not in the money itself. But we can leverage it. We can use it in a way here that makes a difference there. And so in addition to using our money for things we need in this world, like food and shelter and clothing and those types of things, we always have to have our eye on eternity. We always have to have this understanding that this is not a lasting thing. This is not an enduring thing. And so it should affect the way we do this. And if we're street smart... If we're savvy, if we're shrewd like the dishonest manager, then we'll leverage our money so it doesn't just make a difference here, but it makes a difference there. What is corrupting and unrighteous in that money draws us away from God so often, we can leverage it so that it has a a quality of blessing. It has a righteous quality to it because it affects people who are eternal. That's why I call it the leverage principle. The way we use it here can make an impact there. One of the primary ways as a church that we think about how we can leverage these things is, uh, is in the realm of missions work. Um, we have missionaries that our church partners with that, uh, that are doing work on, on the other side of the world. And so we can take some of the money that we have here and give it to them and they can use it there. And there's a, a leverage here. We can make a difference in the lives of people we may never meet until eternity. This is different than just throwing money at a problem, too. There's, there's a quality to this that, that has to be understood. It's, there's a depth to it that it's not just meeting a need. It's meeting a need for an eternal purpose. And, uh, and there's, there's lots of ways in our community that these things can, can happen. There's, a, there's an organization that I work with. Um, I, just, I volunteer with them. It's called the Berlin Area Ministries United, or BAMU. We're thankful we're not in Delmar. Thank you. Yeah. But one of the things that ministry does is try to help people that are kind of, you know, kind of in a tough situation. And and this is the idea. We can we can help people with a small amount of financial burden maybe. Uh, but I have an opportunity to sit down with them and talk with them and say, "Look, money will fix that problem right there because this is the world we live in. You need money to fix some problems." Uh, but there are other problems that need dealt with that money can't fix. There are other things that um, we have to give our attention to that only happen in the context of the church. And so this is how not just this church, but other churches are leveraging what we have to make an eternal impact on people's lives. It's not just throwing money at a problem, uh, because that doesn't fix things. It, it, it puts a band-aid on something. You know, it, it, it may stop the bleeding, but it doesn't, cause, it doesn't fix the problem. We have to have a much more holistic approach. And so that's an organizational approach to this principle, the leverage principle. 
but there's also a personal application here. And this is one thing that I always try to, I don't know about always, but I try to make a connection to. There are things that we do as a church that can make a difference in the community, but ultimately Christianity is both collective, corporate as a church, and it's personal. So just writing a check and dropping the offering basket doesn't get you off the hook for leveraging these things in your life, for making a difference in, in the eternity of other people. We all have talents that God has gifted us with. We're, some of us are good at some things and not so good at other things. We can leverage what we're good at to influence people, to make a difference in the lives of people, not just to fix problems here, but to connect them with what's coming. We're, we're all given the same amount of time, and, uh, and we're all responsible for that. And so we all have 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and how we leverage that time for eternity makes a difference. Time is a, is, a, is a world thing. In eternity, there is no time. We don't have to worry about having enough time to help people. Here we do. And so there's a, an amount, a certain amount of responsibility that we take on ourselves so that we leverage what we're good at, uh, how much time we have, and what we possess to make an eternal difference in people's lives. This is a responsibility on the church as a whole, but it's also a responsibility on each of us individually. And, uh, and this is the idea, I think, that Jesus is getting at. There are worldly things that we're involved in just by the fact that we're here, that we're alive. We have to pay bills and we have to feed ourselves and our kids, no matter how many of them you have. And uh, you know, there's things you have to do. That's just the way it is here. And often we see this as a, a purposeless cycle. We get up, we go to work, we come home, we go to bed. We get up, we go to work, we go home, and around we go. But there's something redemptive about this cycle when we see what Jesus is saying about it. We can leverage this meaningless cycle to make an impact on other people's lives. And this happens um, in, in, you know, in conjunction with our mission statement, love God and love people. Understanding how God fits into that. And how God has staged us at various places, whether it's where we live or where we work or otherwise. And then God has given us this, this command that we're to love our neighbor. And so the cycle has a, a vertical intersection and a horizontal intersection. So it's not meaningless. The work of Christ speaks tremendous volumes to this. And it gives us great meaning in what we do. And so... Even in what we might deem mundane things, when we involve Christ in it, and when we involve other people in it, it begins to take on an eternal quality. It begins to take on a lasting component. And this is uh, what Jesus is driving at here. You, you have some money, you got to buy stuff with it, but don't forget to leverage it. Don't forget that there's a way to use it to impact other things and other people for eternity. And when all things are said and done, when this world passes away and when money no longer has value, we'll be able to see the eternal benefit, the eternal difference that it's made. Uh, secondly, in verses 10 through 12, Jesus gives us the faithfulness principle. There's three parts to this principle. First, in verse 10, Jesus says in small matters, excuse me, Jesus says faithfulness in small matters leads to being entrusted with more. So even if we only have a small amount, it's crucial that when we understand money's confinement to this world, we handle it faithfully. Jesus doesn't call uh, just the rich people to be faithful and generous. He calls all of us to be faithful and generous. And so whether we're poor or rich or in between, these things apply to us. Uh, secondly, in verse 11, Jesus makes sure that we understand it's not about getting more. The point of faithfulness isn't to get more. Uh, this is something that's often misconstrued, I think, by what... What you see sometimes in what we call prosperity preachers, you see on some of the TV preachers, you know, if you if you send in your seed money of a hundred dollars, you'll have it returned a thousandfold, and then you read the little disclaimer on the bottom of the screen that says, you know, this is not investment advice and blah blah blah. Well, no disclaimers here, but Jesus builds off of the first part to get to the second part. The point isn't the quantity; the point is that we're faithful with it. The point is that we understand the purpose of it. And that God has given it to us to leverage for His glory, not just our own uses. Uh, if we aren't faithful with a small amount or a large amount that only matters in this world, Jesus says true riches will elude us. True riches are those things that last for eternity, the things that last forever. 
And this is the motivation behind the first thing, the leverage principle. If we don't see the importance of leveraging what we have to influence people for eternal purposes, then it's because we failed to see any eternal purpose. If there is no eternal purpose, go spend it however you want. Do whatever you want with it. You know, enjoy, enjoy life. See you later. But we're all sitting here because we know there are eternal purposes. There are eternal things that matter now, today. So this is why faithfulness is required of us. When we, when we apprehend the true riches that God gives us in Christ, the forgiveness, the, the amazing grace that we sang about, the hope that we have in the resurrection, when we understand these things, it gives us a perspective on what we have. And we can, we can understand how that can be relegated and limited to this world and yet used to make a difference in the world to come. And so it, the importance of the faithfulness in dealing with the things God has given us is because it points us to Him. It, it's, a, it's a natural outflow of understanding who Christ is for us and understanding how much that matters, not just one day, but how much that matters now, how much He changes our lives now. In verse 12, Jesus contrasts the wealth of the two worlds. In this world, money means wealth. But in the world to come, salvation means wealth. And this is the third part of the the faithfulness principle. If we're faithful with what isn't ours, then we'll be rewarded with our own. If we're faithful with what we can't keep, we'll receive what we can't lose. There was a missionary back, I think it was in the 60s, his name was Jim Elliott, and he's famously known for going to a tribe of people, I believe in the Amazon, and when he got there, they killed him. He went there because these people had never had access to the gospel, and this was a tremendous burden on him. And so, because he thought, you know, how, how could it be that people haven't heard the name of Christ? He understood true riches. And so he goes to these people, and they killed him. He's famously known for saying this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus calls us to understand what we're living for. He calls us to understand that we live for His kingdom faithfully, and this life isn't all there is. We're supposed to make preparations and provisions for this life. That's that's a given. But it's foolishness to not consider the life to come. It's foolishness to make preparations for this life, to to deal with the things we have to deal with in this life without considering eternity. So this means leveraging not just our treasure, but also our time and our talents for the glory of God and for the uh, eternal impact of other people that God has sovereignly placed in our lives. This means trusting in Christ. Foremost. Because He's the one that secures our salvation. He's the one that assures of us, uh, us of forgiven sin. And when we get this, when we understand this, then it puts everything else in perspective. Now, finally, in verse 13, Jesus gives us the devotion principle. We are created to be devoted to God alone and live in the light of His claim upon our lives. But there are other influences at work in this world. Other places in the Bible describe these influences Uh, like pleasure and power and possessions. These things tempt us. Alongside them work the way the world is and the flesh and then the the devil. They work alongside these things to turn our devotion away from God. And in verse 13, Jesus speaks specifically to one of the strongest things in this world that turn us away from God, our possessions. Many translations, including the one I use, the ESV, translates this word money. But it can be also understood as possessions or wealth. It's, it's bigger than money. It certainly includes money, but it's bigger than that. But it has a corrupting nature to it, which I've already mentioned. It, it only has worth in this world. One of the funniest illustrations I've heard about this is that uh, you've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul. <laughs> it's, it's silly, because what do you need it for? Well, that's the whole point now, isn't it? What do you need it for? It's, in, it's of great value in this world, but the time will come when it has no value. And so the way we handle this, the effect that we let our, our possessions and our money have on us, is, is a test to our devotion. The wealthy people constantly worry about taking their money. People, about people taking their money. Uh, poor people constantly worry about getting more money. And middle class people worry about both. There's this 
this effect that money has on us. It captures our attention. It captures our focus in the way other things can't. And so it becomes a test. And this is Jesus lays it out this way. It becomes a test for our devotion to God. The way we earn our money, the way we spend our money, and the way we give our money are all indicators of whether or not God has our hearts. And that's something that I can't judge. Uh, only you can judge that for yourself. The way you look at your own life and see these things. Um, Jesus tells a story about uh, he's sitting outside the temple with his disciples one day and there's wealthy men going in and dropping huge chunks of money in the, in the temple. And then a, an old widow goes in and puts two pennies or two mites, as they're called, the smallest coin they had, puts two of those in there. And Jesus asked his, his disciples, which one gave the most? And they're like, oh, well, that one dude put in, I don't know how much, he had a bucket. And he says, well, the, the old widow gave the most because she gave everything she had. This is a, the devotion principle. Yeah, we need money in this world. That's, that's a given. There's things that have to happen. Money does have value in this world, and that can't be denied. But there's a time coming when that value will be no more. And as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we always have to keep our eye looking that way. We have a foot in both worlds. It makes it terribly difficult. We're often second-guessing, you know, should I have spent my money on that because I could have spent it here? Or, or you know, the, we have these questions where we second-guess ourselves. But the point of it all is, are we letting God rule and reign in our hearts? Or are we driven by something else? Are we driven by something lesser? And these three things relate because if God doesn't have your heart, then you won't be faithful with what you've been given and you certainly won't see the value of leveraging it for eternal purposes. But if God does have your heart, have your heart, then money has its proper place in your life and you'll find ways to leverage it to make an eternal impact in the lives of other people. Are you leveraging what you have for eternity? Are you being faithful to honor God and what you've earned and what you've been given? And where is your devotion today? Jesus spent a lot of time talking about money. And I try not to talk about it too much, but sometimes it just needs to be said. There are so many people that are lost in its corruption. I mean, we know these people. The, the most noble thing that they can live for is getting a little bit more. And it's terribly sad. It's a sad existence that that's the highest thing that they would live for. Jesus gives us more. He gives us something better. We live for eternal purposes. We live for Him. And so whether we have abundance or lack in this world, our eye is fixed on eternity. So our circumstances don't necessarily dictate our, our direction in life because it's directed to Him. And this, when we get this perspective too, when we understand the value of, of the salvation that Jesus has given us now, and we begin to live for his kingdom, then we see the lostness of the people around us who only live this way. How it's so, it's, it's vain, it's empty. People who live this way. And it's, again, it's terribly sad. And again, we have the opportunity to leverage what we have to make an impact in their lives. So we can love God, and love people, and use our money, or we can love our money and use people. And Jesus says you can't, you can't do both. You love God or you love your stuff. So where is your heart today? This is, this is a question that merits asking on a regular basis. Where is your heart today? Some of you may need to give your life to Christ for the, for the first time. Maybe your, your heart is caught up in the, in the cares of this world and the, in the pursuits of this world and you can't seem to shake it. You need to give your life to Christ and say, God, here am I. Forgive me, make me right, set me right with you. But others of us, maybe we've just allowed our, our focus to be taken a little off path. And we need to come to Christ in repentance today. So wherever you are, let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. Uh, let's pray together. God, we thank you that you have given us everything we have. Your scripture says you've given us everything we need for life and for godliness. So God, I pray that our possessions wouldn't possess us, but that we would have a perspective of eternity with these things. God, this can be a sensitive subject, and I pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts 
is so that we would love you more than our stuff. God, if there's someone here who hasn't yet given their life to you, I pray that today would be the day where they forsake the things of this world and live for the one to come. Where they give their lives to you to rule and to reign over their lives. And God, those of us who have done this, who have made this commitment to seek you, to follow you as our Lord and Savior, Lord, help us not to uh, forget. Help us not to run from what you have for us to to seek the things of this world, but to seek you and you first and you alone. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our benediction is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these things, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Let this not be said of us. Pursue Christ alone. Pursue what lasts for, forever. Uh, live your life to that end, to, to what matters. Not what fades away, but what is lasting. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. Good to see everybody.